salvation. May our plans prosper, and may it be it according to your will. All this we pray in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I would like to welcome you all to this presentation entitled Federalism and Academic Institutions, the Role of the Academe in the Discourse on Federalism. With President Duterte's desire to federalize the country, the Philippines seems to enter another stage of its democratic experience. This will definitely have implications across sectors, one of which is the education sector. The aim of this roundtable discussion is to explore the possible contributions of the academe to the burgeoning discourse on federalism in the Philippines. Another aim is to explore the possible administrative implications on the education system. To give us an idea about the Pakighinabi session, may I call on the director of the Center for Politics and International Affairs, Mr. Neil Ryan Pancho. Thank you, uh, Professor Morales. A um, few weeks ago, um, we, we decided to call this Pakiginabi session because there has been many talks about federalism. Then the question on our part, what would be this, the very face, the very form of federalism that we are going to discuss or are going to implement in the Philippines? So on our part, we decided to provide a venue for everyone to talk about this. So this is only a, a small part because in the afternoon there will be a bigger part in discussing these alternatives on, on federalism. The format that we are going to apply in this session, we call this one Pakighinabi because this is a university project. When you say Pakighinabi, it's actually a space, a space for conversation in the university. It's actually the uh, university venue of a shared discernment on critical issues using multidisciplinary approach where opinions from many sides of an issue are heard, critical thinking is valued, and the gift of collegiality is cherished. The Pakiginabi is foremost gathering, and secondly, it is a format for a conversation style or an exchange of ideas and on this particular note, I'd like you to welcome, I'm open at the same time, I welcome you for uh, agreeing with, with our uh, uh, invitation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Pancho. Moving on to our discussion proper. Our lead discussant for this morning is an assistant professor of the Polit Political Science Department in the University of the Philippines, Diliman. He graduated from the University of the Philippines with a Bachelor of Arts degree in Political Science. In the same institution, he obtained his MA degree in Political Science with his thesis entitled Decentralization of Education at the Municip Municipal Level, a New Institutionalist Study on the Local Chief Executive and Citizens Dynamics in the Municipality of Nasugbo, Batangas. His research interests involve topics on local governance, education, electoral dynamics, crisis management, poverty alleviation, as well as migration and climate change. He is currently handling two research projects. One is about health, gains, and re-election, an analysis of the influence of local health improvements on the 2013 elections, and the second one is on poverty alleviation in the wake of Typhoon Yolanda. Ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor John Robert Go. Okay. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. I can see my back. <laughs> okay. uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be invited again here at Ateneo de Davao University. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to share some of my insights. Uh, and I hope, uh, since this is a roundtable discussion, we'll be able to exchange insights. No? And I'm very much interested to learn from, from everyone. Okay. And I hope maybe even the students can participate during the discussion if they would like to. Okay, so the, the topic uh, I was asked to talk about 
is uh, federalism and academic institutions. Okay. Particularly looking at the role of the academe in the discourse on federalism. Of course, uh, federalism has been a buzzword recently, especially that the president has uh, expressed his preference for a federal form of government. And therefore, this has uh, created interest uh, among uh, students and scholars alike. Um, but uh, the movement to shift from the unitary to a federal form of government has begun as early as, I mean, I think when we had uh, the people power in 1987. No? As early as that time, there were already movements towards a uh, federal government. In fact, there were people who were already lobbying as early as that time to adopt a federal form of government. And uh, one of the pioneers, I think, for this one is uh, Dr. Jose Abueva, former UP president and professor emeritus of uh, public administration. He was one of the main proponents of a federal form of government for the Philippines. But today, we'll not zero in on federalism alone, but we will look on how this would affect the uh, academic institutions, mm, where we all belong, right? So, um, let's just let them come in. Okay, so, so in a sense, um, so in a sense, we would like to see where we will be coming into the bigger picture of federalism. Okay. How will us, academics, scholars, uh, play our roles in perhaps responding to the challenges of federalism ahead of us? Okay. And I think one of the biggest challenges that we must uh, face right now is uh, what kind of contribution can we provide as an academic institution in the current discussion on federalism, okay? Surely there, there are materials that we can read online. No? There are uh, op-eds. No? Uh, we, we can see that uh, through face, Facebook, blogs, no? uh, even uh, columns in uh, newspapers. Um, but, uh, there is perhaps a different uh, expectation coming from the academic community. Because one, we are expected to be those who studied the Philippines, okay, in its various aspects, social, economic, cultural, political aspects, okay, of Philippine life. And therefore, our inputs are expected to be more nuanced. Okay? Because textbooks will tell us the experiences of other countries, particularly of the United States, when we talk about federalism. Okay? Because uh, if you are looking at presidential federal system, I mean, the uh, American case is, well, not necessarily the best, but the most used example. So uh, if we are going to talk about federalism in the Philippines, the people who are expected to provide uh, insights would be the academic community, okay? And for sure, we will be informed by our different researches, no? And uh, as we give our analysis and as we give our uh, insights on, on the subject matter. So how could academic institutions contribute to the current discourse on federalism in the Philippines, okay? I see that our contribution can be twofold. Number one, academic institutions can spearhead in their respective localities awareness campaigns, not only on federalism, but also on constitutional change and design. Okay? Um, in the Philippines, there is at least one university in a province. And I think, uh, as a university, it's not just a teaching I mean, institution, but it's also uh, a research institution, uh, an extension institution. And therefore, we expect that 
uh, our researches will feed into our extension work. And here, I see academic institutions spearheading awareness campaigns. Um, do people know what federalism really means? Uh, and I think it, it, it's now incumbent upon us, academic institutions, to help people to become more aware of what federalism is all about, such that they will not accept it as it is. Na parang pag tinanong, uh, is federalism okay for you? Well, if the president says it's okay, then I'm okay with it. But we, we, cannot, be, uh, we cannot settle with that kind of reasoning. No? Um, I mean, if we ask our students and if they would answer that way in any other question, we would be mad, right? Kasi kailangan natin may, may processing, understanding, at saka analysis, no? So if you would just take federalism as it is, without looking at the nuances, then perhaps uh, we are becoming, uh, uh, we are not performing our role as an academic, as an academic institution, okay? But not only on federalism, but also on constitutional uh, change and design. Because federalism is just one aspect of this, okay? If we're going to look at the shift from unitary to federal form of government, we are looking at it as a constitutional change project. We want to change the constitution. And by changing the constitution, we are changing the design of our government. And it so happened that we are choosing, or maybe there is a conscious effort to adopt a federal form of government. Okay. So why, I mean, we, we must first que uh, ask the questions, why do we have to change the Constitution? And if we are going to change the Constitution, how do we change it? Okay. By asking how, it's not simply the process of changing it, whether constitutional convention or constituent assembly, but also the question of how are we moving forward? Are we moving forward towards a federal form of government? Are we keeping a unitary form of government? Or maybe we can devise on our own a hybrid system that is workable for the Philippines. So these are the questions that we must start to entertain and we must raise the awareness that federalism is not just the only way. Okay? And federalism is not a one-size-fits-all idea. No? There are different forms of federalism. If you are into models, there are different models of federalism which may or may not be applicable to the Philippine case. Okay, so that's one. Making people aware of what federalism is and the idea of constitutional change and design. The second one is that the academic institutions, especially those in the provinces, can come up with learning materials in their local languages to make concepts and ideas and information and federalism as accessible to as many audience. Okay. Because if you read uh, books on federalism, these are technical explanations. And uh, if these are technical explanations, it's already creating a barrier between the reader and the material. Okay? So as academic institutions, we can translate them into a more understandable language, accessible language to the common tao. Okay? Not to say that we distinguish between educated and non-educated ones, but we want to make the information as accessible as possible to the extent that we want them translated to their local languages. Okay? Because again, language is a barrier. English is uh, usually used to explain federalism. In fact, federalism is English, right? The idea is Western. Okay, so how do we make it our own? Siyempre, hindi naman tayo hahanap ng counterpart or mag-invento ng salita to complement or to, to be equivalent to uh, federalism. But the point is, we want to translate the ideas into something that is understandable. And 
who is the best person or who are the best set of people to do that? I think it's the academic institutions. Okay. Those who are studying can do that. Okay. Because, for example, federalism has uh, social aspects, economic aspects, cultural aspects, and political aspects. And who are the best people to do that? No, to translate that into something understandable. Diba? Because at the end of the day, what do we want to do? To inform the public. And I think that is the very role of the university. It's not just to grant degrees. No? It's not just to make uh, many graduates, alumni, who will contribute eventually. <laughs> but to... Uh, ensure that people are aware of the different phenomena that is happening around them. Okay. So those are the two things that I think could be the best contributions of the academic community as we engage with the discourse on federalism. So spearheading awareness campaigns okay, on federalism and constitutional change and uh, coming up with materials in local languages to make information accessible. In fact, uh, it does not necessarily have to be books or pamphlets. You know, right now, uh, people are fond of uh, infographics. Yeah, so we can make those. Uh, and then we can design posters, make them available in public places. Okay, And I think that could already uh, initiate. Um, right now, um, there are already discussions happening. Okay, I mean, among jeep jeepney drivers, uh, tricycle drivers, uh, mga sidewalk vendors. If you listen to them, they do discuss these things. Okay, and it's uh, I think it's a good sign that they become more aware of this. And of course, what better way to help them in their discussion, in their decision making? but to give them additional information, which could strengthen their claims, no? if they, especially if they're very passionate about their ideas. So I think we can help them like that, in that way. Okay? So uh, what is the most immediate problem which the academy could address in the face of the current administration's push for federalism? I think, uh, okay, coming up from this, uh, uh, twofold uh, contribution, I think you already know what I think is the problem, and it's the information, okay, the problem on information. With scholars studying various aspects of Philippine society, the academic community is rich in resources which can be tapped in order to promote the discourse, okay? We want to promote conversation. Um, proper information on the subject matter is necessary to ensure that People are aware of the possible changes that will occur. What will happen if we shift to a federal form of government? That's usually the question. Then we try to provide answers. Not to say that these are the actual things that will happen, but we try to provide answers. So we can say there would be a state government, there would be reconfiguration, there would be uh, these things and that. Especially if we combine federalism with a parliamentary form of government, that makes it even more complicated, and especially since we have been presidential for a long time. Okay? Having been under a unitary presidential system, the people may not be as attuned to the idea of a federal setup. Okay? This is something we in the academe can provide. With enough information, people can formulate informed opinion and take position in the debate for constitutional change. Okay? So I would like to emphasize that this is a debate for constitutional change, not just on federalism. Okay. Because we are talking about unitary and federal form of government. Are we sticking to what we have? Are we moving to another form? In fact, in the process, we may want to ask what is wrong and what are we trying to address by having these changes. Okay. And in the course of us informing and making people aware, we can pinpoint that, hey, these are the things that we find lacking in the current system, which we think can be resolved by 
a federal form of government. And in that way, we can help them convince or we can help them decide against federalism. Either way, we were able to help them. Okay. So uh, there's this one interesting question. What teaching strategies could be employed to inform our students on federalism? Because uh, where do we start educating? Diba? But through our students, and hopefully our students will echo it with, to their families. Diba parang ganun naman yun, may uh, domino effect or trickle-down effect. So coming from university, so students who are listening right now, it is expected, no, not expected naman siguro, no, but it is hope that uh, you will echo what you will be learning from the discussion, especially later. Okay, and if you will be attending the uh, forum this afternoon, ano, to share whatever you learn to your family, and hopefully your families will share it to your neighbors so that we will have a more informed society, okay? So the best way in my view to inform students, and I'm assuming these are university students, okay, on federalism is to give them different materials, both scholarly and otherwise, on federalism as a concept, the experiences of other federal countries, the stories of successful and failed federalism, and materials on Philippine society, culture, and politics. By letting students read, we are giving them the opportunity to learn on their own. Again, assuming that they are reading these materials. No? I mean, it's our usual problems as teachers. When we give materials to students, they photocopy it, but uh, they just photocopy it sometimes. Or they highlight it. Okay, just for the sake of color, I, I guess. No, so teachers can only provide guidance. This is our limitation, though. No, as teachers, we can only provide guidance. Learning comes from the eagerness on the part of the students to know beyond what they believe in. Okay, I think that must be emphasized to know beyond what they believe in because they believe this is it. But if we encourage them to know more it will not just be a belief, right? <laughs> that would be strengthened, okay? And I think that is the scholarship that we want to uh, evoke from our students anyway, okay? So in the process, they can carefully formulate their position. Why? Because uh, we expose them to what federalism is. Second, we expose them to the experiences of other federal states, okay? And mind you, there are stories of success and failure. There are successful federal systems. There are failed federal systems. And we want to expose people to both the successful and failed stories. Otherwise, no, we are being blind of the reality. Na, parang, is federalism the solution? Di ba? Parang, so on the one hand, we teach them how to work on a review of literature, sobrang academic, sorry. Eh. Pero uh, if, if they can read and process, di ba? they can work towards a review of literature. I think uh, as an academic institution, this is one of the skills that we want to impart on our students. And then on the other hand, we allow them to be more aware of the positive and negative effects of federalism in our society, in a society and in our society. And then, because this is about strategies, we can adopt several activities. Eh, natatawa si Kuya dun sa monitor. Sino ba yun? Okay. <laughs> then we can adopt several activities such as debates. And I think uh, this could uh, unleash the creative juices out of our students, no? Debates, no? Oh, for example, you take the side of parang keeping the unitary system or shifting to federal form. So they can come up with arguments. They can converse. Okay. Essay writing. Let their ideas come out in form of words and essays. And then you get it published. Diba? May student publication naman tayo. Diba? And then there are other avenues. No? Uh, if you want young blood in Inquirer, I think they are accepting short essays there. So, yan. And then panel discussions like this. Compose of students. No? So maganda rin yung malaman natin kasi we have our expert opinion sometimes, no? Uh, what are the opinion of students who are still grounded with their families, no? Na, ganun. Okay, so 
which can test if the information has been processed, analyzed, and understood. Okay. So, nandun pa rin ako sa idea of testing kasi nga, academic tayo, di ba? Uh, nasa academic institution, no? So, pinabasa mo sila, may activity. So, that is to test if they learned something from their activity. Uh, from, from what they have read. Di ba? Now, what are the pitfalls to be avoided when teaching about federalism? Okay. And I, I try to, I tend to become generic here, no? Because as, perhaps as with any other topic, teaching of federalism should not end like uh, proselytizing. Parang, ah, federalism is federalism. You know, it's like telling you that federalism is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Okay, so teacher, teachers may, of course, advocate a position on the subject because we, we do research and based on our research, we take our positions and we share that to our students, di ba? Mas maganda nga yun eh, kasi research, uh, uh, it's founded on research, it's grounded yung tinuturo natin sa estudyante. However, I believe that in order to inspire a more critical appreciation of federalism, students must be encouraged to advocate their position regardless of their teachers. So, for example, I am for federalism. And then based on your reading, you don't agree. So that's just fine. Di ba? I mean, students here, if you don't agree with your teachers, that's just fine. Just be respectful though. <laughs> Di ba? Parang, if you don't agree with the position of other people, just respect their ideas. Okay? I see this as a major pitfall. There is a tendency to romanticize the positive effects of federalism. And especially now, yung mga advocates, talaga ang focus lang nila, ito yung positive effects. We must focus on this. Of course, we must appreciate the positive ones. Pero, di ba, parang uh, so mga cost-benefit analysis, halimbawa, these are the costs, these are the benefits. Does the benefit outweigh the cost? Di ba? Baka naman mas costly siya kaysa sa benefit. So, anong ibig niyang sabihin? So, magagamit niyo yung mga lenses ninyo sa inyong mga disiplina para maintindihan ng mga bagay na ito. And to the extent that it may be seen as a panacea to all problems in our society. As I mentioned earlier, federalism is not a solution to all problems. Definitely, it is not. There's also a tendency to antagonize the proposal. Ito naman, on the other end, no? Na parang, uh, perhaps because if you do not agree with the president or with his party mates or with the people he is around with, so you do not agree at all. Okay, without even listening to the benefits of it. No? So dismissing it as a politically and culturally insensitive attempt to uh, change the, the constitution and all other things among others. Okay? So by this, we become automatic roadblocks in the very discourse we wish to promote. If we outrightly antagonize or if we simply uh, romanticize. Okay. Uh, what we want to have is a conversation, right? We want to promote our role in the academe as in the discourse on federalism. So, let there be open discussions. Okay? And whether you agree or not, let us listen to each other. Okay? And I hope we will not reach the point na magsusuntukan, yung ganyan, no? Kasi, hindi na academic yun. Okay? So what research topics could be formed out of the recent discourse on federalism? So napaka-academic talaga, no? Research topics, okay? Uh, hindi ko na na-type yung sagot ko dito. Pero um, naiisip ko kanina habang nasa airport. Kasi parang natagalan ako yung pag-iisip ng mga possible research topics, no? Um, we have rich resource on studies about local politics. Okay, we can start there because essentially federalism is about distribution of power. Power sharing from national to state governments. Okay. And by looking at the studies on local politics, we can get some insights, experiences. How do local governments, provincial, city municipal, even down to the barangay level, are able to perform the functions given to them under the local government code. There are success stories and not so successful ones, right? And those can inform us already because if we are entering a federalism project, that would definitely entail devolution of powers. Okay. So, so with that, we want to already look 
No? So we can start by evaluating the experiences of different uh, municipalities or cities. No? Uh, students looking for research topic, so you go close to home uh, in your city, in your municipality. And there are a lot of different aspects you can study about local governments, health, education, social welfare, agriculture, tourism, uh, fiscal management, environment, um, public works, yeah, and all other things, no? Policies, you can be policy specific, ordinances, etc., etc., which you can already use to evaluate how local governments are performing, okay? And then based on those uh, researches, you can already look at uh, oh, what if we have a federal form of government will be more independent. Can they, can they have sustainable uh, programs then after that? So don't mo na makikita ngayon, no? Uh, how your researches will inform your position. Okay. So how would, now, well, so we're done with what we can contribute as an academic institution, you know? Uh, two minutes na lang. Oh, meron pa akong tatlong questions. Sige, I'll try to, uh, <laughs> masyado pong mahaba. Okay lang, no? Okay. So, how would federalism affect academic institutions in the Philippines? And I think this taps into my master's thesis a bit. Because what are the administrative implications to school should federalism happen in the Philippines? Is it tantamount to the decentralization of our educational system? Yes. Federalism may not just be decentralization, but devolution. But in the current proposal of uh, Senator uh, Nene Pimentel, uh, he believes that education must remain in the federal government. So it's still centralized. Curriculum uh, is centralized. Uh, because the second question, what are the benefits and disadvantages of uh, a decentralized educational system? Would this mean greater freedoms in developing curriculum content and propagate regional ethnic identities? Um, if we will not follow the Pimentel uh, proposal, perhaps we can uh, do that. Curriculum be decentralized and devolved. There would be a core curriculum which all schools around the country can have, but each region can add something uh, that would uh, uh, be sensitive to the demands of the region or uh, ethnic identities. Uh, for example, here in Davao, so you will have the core math, science, English, Filipino, and all other things. And then you can uh, take in uh, some, something about the culture of Davao or, or the, the region you know, that could uh, help students be more aware of the environment where they are at, OK? Because uh, under a federal form, the state government becomes the more immediate one, okay? The more proximate one to the public, okay? So, kumbaga, of course, you will still recognize yourselves as Filipinos under the Philippine flag, okay? But then, uh, it is uh, useful for you to be more aware of the society where you belong. And we can have those adjustments if we, under, uh, if the, if we will shift to a federal form, if, and if in that shift we dis de devolve education, no, and that would include curriculum, then that would be fine. Administratively, it would also be good if we decentralize because the current problems that we are facing in the Department of Education, and I'm talking more on, on about public schools than private ones, no? Because in public schools, for example, the appointment of teachers would have to go as high as regional offices or even national office, I think, in Pasig City, okay? Uh, the filling up of an item 
goes as high as the department level. So, uh, and, and this could affect the kind of services, particularly in education, the procurement of textbooks, hiring of teachers, building of classrooms. If it remains centralized, then uh, it becomes uh, a bigger problem because uh, local governments will be able to, do, to determine the demands. No? For example, we need more classrooms because we are anticipating this number of students. They can right away uh, provide funds for that because there is a special education fund anyway that each local government unit already has. special education. So you can already spend those funds for for education. Okay. But in the current situation it's very limited. What can you spend for a special education fund, for example? Schools, teachers and Mind you, the teachers that can be hired by the local government unit would have lower salaries than their debt ed counterparts. So that, in a sense, you are giving, I mean, you're giving the same effort. Uh-oh. So, so, you may mga ganong, uh, ano, okay. May mga ganong rep So, administratively, there will be implications. Okay. Uh, the current uh, division district system would have to be reconfigured if we will federalize. Uh, because uh, each municipality will have a school board. Each state may have its own department of education that will determine the set of its curriculum. So, um, of course, at the onset, it might be uh, how they structure this. That, that would be the question. But eventually, I hope we can see that it could be helpful as well. Since... Uh, it is also an opportunity to streamline the education bureaucracy once we have <laughs> decentralized and uh, adopted uh, a federal system of government. Okay. I guess that's all because I have no time left. <laughs> okay. And thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to our discussion. Thank you, Professor Go. Before I proceed to the second session of this RTD, uh, Professor Pancho has something to tell us. Perhaps a few reminders. Okay, uh, to, together. together with the session this afternoon, the CPIA, the Center for Politics and International Affairs, will be publishing uh, this proceeding. At the same time, we are covered uh, by uh, Facebook Live and YouTube. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we now proceed to the second session of this RTD. Um, joining in this roundtable discussion are representatives from respective disciplines. We have Professor John Harvey Gamas, Chair of the International Studies Department. Professor Maria Richel Abordo, Chair of the Economics Department. Professor Rawi Kimba, Faculty of the Theology Department. Dr. Emmanuel Alvior, Chair of the Department of Governance. <laughs> Professor Ramor, Ramon Beleno, Chair of the Political Science and History Department. <laughs> Dr. Jonald Fenesius, uh, Chair of the Mathematics Department. Dr. Jerome Serrano, Chair of the Sociology Department. Dr. Adeline Gopiteo, Chair of the Education, uh, Teacher Education Department. Attorney Nagib Sinarimbo, representative from the MILF. <laughs> Professor Cesar Ledesma, uh, representative from Lehok Federal. And Attorney Randall uh, Pakashon, sir? Parkashon, I'm sorry. Parkashon, Attorney Randolph Parkashon, represent, representative from the MNLF. Each panel discussant will be given two minutes to present their main statement. May we proceed? Uh, may we start with Professor Gamas? Sure. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> thank you, my dear colleague. Um, thank you very much. 
um, for that very enlightening um, presentation, um, Robert. Um, actually, I have nothing to say you know, academically, but more of questions, really. Um, you said that we have to spearhead the awareness campaign, um, also come up with learning materials. So this already presupposes that um, teachers have knowledge, at least um, um, basic information on federalism, but I think it's it's not sufficient to to go to the public to, to go to the people without going back to the primary sources to the main scholars. Um, so the teachers would have to do their homework. No. Um, yeah, definitely. So what do you suggest? No, because most of us here are really um, not specialists in federalism. What do you suggest are the best? Um, materials, best books, uh, scholars to refer to when um, we develop uh, um, this this awareness campaign uh, um, and also learning materials, and also for our sake you know, to, to to develop um, the review of related literature. You know, it's it's very important for an academic to have um, extensive reading. So that's my first question. Um, materials to be um, recommended. And then second um, would be how could um, non-social science disciplines contribute to this um, awareness campaign? Like, I, I, I don't know if I'm preempting the question of um, Dr. John Alfinesios, but you know, how could mathematics, for example, um, contribute to the development of this discourse no, in, in, on federalism. Um, what, what about um, physics, um, environmental science? Okay. Because there is an assumption that this is the role of the social sciences. Okay. So what about these other disciplines? Thank you. Uh, I quite agree with Sir Gamas because for me personally, it's an esoteric topic, the federalism. First is I am asking myself that we as a nation should make informed choices. And for example, we in the academy should actually empower our students to make informed choices. And that is very good uh, requirement for a voter. Uh, we might want to explain to them the cost and benefit of making such decision towards federalism. But my comment is this is what you call perceived or expected cost and benefit. Nobody among us had really experiences. So for example, if we read uh, literature, there are experiences of other federal states that work or did not work. We might be, for me, the factors that make them successful. What are those necessary and sufficient conditions for this to work in that? Uh, maybe that is the role of us in the academy to find that. And then the third one is very challenging, how to get the students very much interested on this. Like for example, in economics, we have limitations, for example. So you talk about uh, devolution of power. So my question is this, parang the, the one that I have in mind is, um, in economics, we talk about attaining efficiency. But this is more about the question of equality, distribution of power and resources. And in the economics discipline, well, we don't have a common definition of the word equality. So for me, the challenge is there is a need for us to go into multidisciplinary. I think this is really multidisciplinary. Third is talking about the constitutional change. I'm very much um, interested on the provisions, for example, uh, economic provisions of that, like I'm asking my friend Neil, is what will happen to the fiscal and monetary policies? Uh, 
I have in mind based on the discussion for fiscal, is it localized like talking about public services, uh, health, education, is it uh, localized? So from the model of Pimentel, parang it's not. And what happens to the monetary policy? I would assume that if we are using, let's say, a common currency, it will still be national. Parang those things that I'm very much interested in. And it will be a good research topic, of course. Thank you, sir. Hi, good morning po to everybody. I, th I am thankful for this opportunity uh, to be sharing what, um, what I know about federalism or constitutional change and uh, also to ask some of the questions that I have in mind. Um, anyway, the governance department has already started with uh, actually, we are looking into uh, giving opportunity to students and faculty of Ateneo to learn more about federalism. As a matter of fact, we'll be starting tomorrow with it. So I'm looking at it as, as a series. So our, our beloved chair of person of the political science department will be our speaker on the, what, on the definition of federalism, possible models of federalism. And then we'll talk about the concern kanina that was shared by, by Rachel on public, on fiscal administration. Of course, when we talk about changes, money will always be uh, involved and it is very important that it, uh, uh, that, that the policies on money matters are clear. So my main concern actually will be, my main question is, do we really need federalism? Uh, because when you take a look at the different papers made on local government, on the evaluation actually made uh, we, uh, in our local government, we can see a lot of problems pa, like the, the cap capability of the local uh, heads, the, the bar actually my studies on barangay. And I'm, I did not yet, uh, I'm not yet, we're not yet done with it. But so far what we can see is that, uh, unfortunately or unfortunately, some of the leaders uh, are <laughs> still lack some of the things that uh, in, on the part of the academe, they still lack some things that they need to know in uh, governing the people, like uh, leadership skills, uh, managerial in a sense, because in their administration, but there are different things to, um, uh, to consider, like posting ba, tama ba ginagawa nila sa budgeting, yung mga ganyan. So maraming dapat pang alamin. So yun, ang concern ko, kailangan ba talaga natin ng federalism or kung talaga kailangan natin magpalit, uh, we should really be looking into the um, the sharing of power uh, for the equitable distribution of wealth also. Kasi kung klaro yung sharing of power, magiging klaro din siguro yung uh, equitable sharing of, of wealth. So, yun lang dapat nating tingnan, kailangan ba talaga natin, at kung kailangan natin, I think we should focus on the sharing of power and the distribution of wealth vis-a-vis -vis the parang ano bang paradigms ang dapat tignan ng local chief executives later on. Uh, ang kanila bang units or local government units will play the residual power, the enabling power, the market role power, mga ganun. So, ano ba ang gagamitin nila in the public service delivery na paradigm? So, I think those are just some of the things that should be considered when we look at... Uh, changing or not changing our constitution or form of government. So yun lamang po. So announcement po, meron pong magaganap na forum bukas. Sana po umaten po kayo. I think all the other schools were also invited po, were already given invitations. So thank you and hope to have more like this. Excuse me, sir. Uh, we, we, let me remind uh, the panel discussants to stick with the time allotted. Thank you. <laughs> Very strict, our moderator. Um, 
one of the things that struck me um, when Mayor Duterte delivered a speech to the nation was his concept on historical injustice. I think it is more felt, more real in Mindanao than perhaps in other areas in the country. And being a theology faculty, so my, my contribution this morning is really to focus on certain aspects. These are actually more questions, uh, more clarifications. Like, if we go to the federal state of government, how, how, does, it, how does it cater to the plural faith confessions that we have in this country? Um, and if that will be catered, addressed by the government uh, through educational uh, change maybe, development of educational curriculum, customized to a particular region, customized to a particular state, how does the federal government overlook or supervise uh, this uh, diversity of uh, faith confessions and faith practices. Although it's a good thing that there is no dominant parang faith confession dictated by the number of membership, uh, but really ma the, the, the concern that I have is how the, based on the experiences of previous countries, of other countries, uh, to what extent that federal sta state uh, become, became an enabler, uh, enabling power of uh, promoting, respecting uh, plurality of religious confessions. Yes, I'm stopping. Thank you. PDP Laban that started here in Mindanao. Uh, the question really is citizenship, and that is the challenge to uh, to the academe. How can we educate and train our students to become uh, mature and participative citizens in the governance of their country? And maybe the, the advantage of a federal form of government is that it provides more venue uh, and the structure wherein the citizens and even the students can really participate. I would like to see again the time when, in the 1970s, when students were active in the political affairs of the country. So I don't see that anymore. morning. So a lot of you, I think, in this room have, are still somewhere there in the spiritual world. No? <laughs> uh, that's how all the idea is. And uh, uh, a lot of things have, you know, have changed. Uh, like uh, coming here, it took me 30 minutes to, you know, looking within the campus where this uh, place is. You know? But I studied here for many years. Anyway, uh, so a lot of things have changed. Uh, I would encourage, of course, a debate, discussions on the merits, the merits of federalism. But let me tell you what we have in mind. What is the structure? What is this federalism? How does it look like? Uh, we have formed a group, uh, the Kilosang uh, uh, Federalismo, uh, spelled P, not F, no, Federalismo, uh, sa pagbabago. Uh, 
Okay, um, this is what we have in mind, and we are throwing this idea to the public, to all who are concerned, who would like to participate in the discussion. Um, first, we look into, uh, okay, if we have federalism, ano bang itsura ng bansa natin? We have proposed that there will be five regional states um, composed of uh, Northern Luzon with 21,417,000 population, Metro Manila with 12,877,000 plus population, Southern Luzon with 23,175,000 uh, uh, population, Visayas with 19,373,000 population, and Mindanao, 24,135,000 population, more or less. Uh, then, uh, once we have that, then uh, the next question is, and this is, uh, I think, uh, true to a lot of people, uh, ano ba yung, how do we delineate uh, uh, powers of governance? So we have national governments, we have regional state governance and local governance. Uh, let me just enumerate to you some of the important powers that shall be retained by national government, uh, which are national security, defense, declaration of war, foreign relations, currency, monetary system, external trade, commerce, citizenship, civil rights, uh, federal ser civil service, administration of justice, um, to name a few. There are actually, in our proposal, about 33 uh, powers that the national government shall retain out of those powers that it is now exercising. For regional states, it will have around uh, uh, 36 uh, powers, and some of which uh, would include uh, uh, jurisdiction over agriculture, forestry, fisheries, environment, natural resources, mining, waterworks, uh, health, education, labor and employment, trade and industry, science and technology, ancestral rights, uh, ancestral lands, um, and uh, all issues pertaining to lands and environment. Of course, it shall include uh, uh, general welfare and internal security. Then uh, these are the dual powers of national and uh, regional states. Then there will be sharing of powers on uh, uh, national state elections, health, education, cultural development, sports development, labor, tourism, energy. There shall be co-management of energy between regional states and uh, national government. Then the Bank Samora issue. We propose that uh, uh, following the two-tired or two-tracked uh, uh, approach that this government is uh, pursuing, meaning we will have first an autonomous region for the Bank Samoro before we shift into federalism. So we say that the Bank Samoro autonomous government shall be governed in accordance with the new law uh, that shall be approved before the ratification of the Constitution of the Federal Republic. The autonomous region shall be part of the regional state government of Mindanao. And then we also would like to change the name uh, we have, there are several suggestions, Maharlika, Luz Biminda, Pearl of Orleans, Rizal, Lapulapo, or Pilipinas. Uh, since I'm running out of time, uh, uh, I hope I will be privileged to discuss some of the points later. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good morning. morning. Frankly, when I was led into this table, I, and I was looking around, I'm in a sea of academics. I feel like moving towards the seats at the back. <laughs> but, but um, and, and if I exceed my time, feel free to, to play the role of Trillianes by <laughs> putting off my microphone. <laughs> so I, 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 essentially, I work for the Peace Panel of the Moro Islamic Liberation Front that negotiated the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro. I also work with the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. So I'll, I'll be sharing a couple of experiences that I think would be relevant to your work as academics uh, on federalism, specifically its uh, impact on education and educational policies. I think in the in the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro, 
the model has always been that of a federal because of the list. In a federal setup, you, because you have a two-tier of government, uh, you have a central government and a state government, naturally you, you, you put a boundary on the powers that may be exercised by either of the, the tiers, meaning what are in the, in the federal list and what are in the state list. In the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samoro, you would note that in the power sharing annex, the, the list of what is exclusive powers includes education. So it means it would be exercised by the Bank Samoro government. It would no longer be exercised by the central government or the government in Manila. So it essentially would be a decentralized educational system in the Bank Samoro. The, the second one that I think is important is other than the local government units, you also have a kind of a decentralization on education in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao, a bigger entity than that of an ordinary LGU because in Article 10, Section 20 of the Constitution, you have there a list of the powers that may be exercised by the autonomous region in uh, Muslim Mindanao, and that includes in the list, educational policies, although it is still subject to uh, national government laws because the framing of the constitutional provision is such that it would still be subject to national laws and the uh, constitution. And therefore, a practical research area for, for you would be um, what was then the impact of decentralization with respect to uh, education in the autonomous region in Muslim Mindanao. That includes uh, the balance between uh, funding education projects in the region, because what happened in, in ARMM is that while educational policies was devolved by national government, the funding for it was never devolved to the regional government. So you have an imbalance in terms of if you pursue these policies, it would not be funded by national government, you'll have to look for funding. And your taxation power is limited and therefore you have an issue of whether you should pursue an independent education policy in the region or you just comply with national, which should also be relevant in the shift towards uh, federal government. The other one that, that I think is important is that um, there are initial studies on funding education and that includes, as earlier mentioned, special education fund, which is collected by an LGU through the real property tax which we should be able to explore when we move towards federalism, meaning how do we balance granting the powers as well as devolving the, the, the power to, to collect the needed revenue to fund policies on education. So thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, I think I need to ask more time because we will be talking on education and there are a lot of problems our educational system is facing right now. I would like to take off my point when uh, John Robert is talking about the proposal of uh, Pimentel where education remains in the federal government. It's, it's centralized. We're hoping to move into federalism thinking that it will give a better look at the Philippine educational system, primarily because of the many schools that we have right now. 46,000 public schools and uh, 13,000 private schools, with 7,000 of those public schools are still in off-grid. So you see the situation of the Philippines. We are trying to move into an international standard and then coping with what is in the international arena and we are grouping in the dark to achieve the quality education that we have in our local regions. That's the foremost problem that we are facing. The very fast transition of our educational system that is not yet ready because teachers are not yet capacitated, they don't have yet the capacity to roll into changing the strategy, pedagogy in the classroom. Third is that the budget that is set to every public school, MOOE given to public school, is not enough to capacitate each and every teacher and to produce 
a particular materials to be used in changing the paradigm from the old system into enhanced basic education curriculum. Now my question is, how can federalism, the chains of our constitution, will be helping our schools, particularly the public schools? And also, concern on the complementarity between public and private. Remember, in our system right now, unitary form of government, only the public schools are receiving support from the government. Private schools are not receiving support from the government. But equally important, both public and private should work hand in hand in achieving the quality of education we have here in our country. Now, if we go for federal government, will it be of help no, in complementary purposes, both the public and the private schools. Will it be a guarantee that our teachers will be capacitated, will be receiving budget in order to cope up with the demands of the skills, knowledge that they need in order to come up with a particular classroom that will answer the call of K-12, to the outcomes-based education, and the typology on quality assurance? And that's a very big problem that we are facing right now. I attended last week an international conference on teacher education. It's a consultative meeting because we will be launching the new curriculum in 2018. And mind you, because this is the, the national government is the one doing that with a technical panel around. So here in Mindanao, we don't have a representative to tell them Basically, what is happening in Mindanao, how can our curriculum be included no, when they plan into this new you know, curriculum for 2018? All right, so as far as the international arena is concerned, we are really moving into outcomes-based education. We are moving into an interdisciplinary education, collaborative education, authentic assessment in the classroom. But mind you, our schools, we just have to put their K-12 ready, but they are not. Schools, because of commercialism, will have to put in every uh, educational institution, we are already implementing OBE, but they are not. So my question is, how can a federal form of government will really help change the landscape of educational system and will help address the Herculean problem of our educational system? Thank you, Dr. Gopiteo. May I remind again our panel discussants to please stick to the time allotted. I understand that we have so many insights and opinions that we have to share. However, we could do so particularly in the main uh, roundtable discussion after you laid down your main argument. Uh, Professor Beleno. Okay. Uh, good morning. Um, it's so nice to have uh, this uh, discussion like this. Uh, in fact, when it was opened, uh, in the CPEA, uh, we are uh, immediately agreed to this uh, discourse for the main reason. For me personally, I uh, got disappointed with the, with the discussion of the BBL last year. Uh, we did this uh, same sort of um, discussion, especially among um, large universities here in Region 11. And it seems like uh, different universities are not interested on the discussion. And the reason for that is it has not been passed and it's irrelevant. So um, now we have this federalism uh, um, suggestion on uh, federalism. And I believe that discussing this is important in actually making uh, people more interested into this. That's why my main point is on the informed decision. Um, taking from uh, a question from a Jesuit political philosopher, uh, Pat Patrick Yarden, Father Patrick Yarden. First question is, what problems do we hope to be resolved? with this. Um, I've listed down some of the problems that um, my colleagues here mentioned earlier, peace in Mindanao, Manila imperialism, molding more mature citizens, limit corruption, make government close to the people, and change the landscape of educational system. Will, making, will uh, pushing federalism answer those problems? So that's one. Second, are these problems inherent in our current form of government? Is it inherent? Okay. Number three, would the same problem exist in any form of government 
we would be adapting. Kasi baka papait lang tayo ng form of government and we would still have the same problem. Okay? So why change? Kung yun din naman yung problema natin. And last is, who will benefit and who will not? Okay? So this is again another discourse on the common good. Father Joel's favorite topic. Okay? So who will benefit and who will not? So will this benefit the majority of the people or will just benefit a few um, privileged individuals? So I will leave you with those questions and hopefully come have a, a better discussion later. Thank you. So I will just read my notes to be able to stick to the three-minute time allotment with a three-minute... Ay, two lang pala? Two-minute time allotment, which, by the way, is strictly implemented by our facilitator. Sige. How do we know that federalism is the only way to address problems of regional discontent and fragmentation? And if there are other models available, how do we know which models truly apply in so far as the Philippines is concerned? This question requires a thorough understanding of the experiences of what are now federal states. One overriding theme in so far as the experience of these countries is concerned is that the transition to federalism is a process of nation building and that this transition is often marred by painful upheavals. Perhaps this is one of the things that we should emphasize to our students because the shift to federalism requires a thorough constitutional change and retooling of our political leadership. It is not just a matter of changing your dress, and once you find that it does not fit, then you go back to your old dress. Hence the fundamental question, are we really ready for this shift? Here, the role of education and the sources of knowledge production are very crucial. But what was missed in the discussion earlier is the increasing use of social media in propagating information about federalism, especially that most of our students are hooked in online technologies. In fact, our lead discussant recognized that many of our students don't read books, research journals, or other academic materials because by extension, there is a presumption that our students generally look for sources that are immediately downloadable in the social media platforms. And this is where the problem lies and a possible source of frustration among teachers because the quality of information that our students may generate from these online technologies is questionable and may be contrary to rational thought, but is merely a product of a carefully designed but meaningless propaganda or advocacy. Students' decisions and choices are becoming more influenced by what they think are credible or popular representations or images rather than desire for critical thought and genuine discourse or dialogue that allows for processing, assessing of information, being able to finally tease out the myths from what is factual, we should inform our courses of action. And this is the promise of science or rational thought, which is what is supposed to be developed within our academic institutions. And this is what we should also develop among our students these days. That would be all. Good morning. Um, some disclosure, I am from the, um, my field is mathematics. <laughs> from uh, my perspective, uh, these are the arguments that at least convince me to take a look at the uh, proposal of shifting from the uniform, uh, from the uh, unitary form of government to uh, federalism. Number one, for many years, only uh, Metro Manila has been has been uh, developed. In fact, it is over um, developed. Yet other areas, such as uh, Visayas or Mindanao, is still um, technically underdeveloped in terms of um, infrastructure as well as the establishment of strong um, universities. To point out, UP or the University of the Philippines enters in Mindanao only recently, just 10 years ago. In my mind, the national government seems to forsake us in this respect. They, force, uh, they failed to provide us, in my view, quality education in, in Mindanao. 
of course, except we have um, MSU IIT, but that is a different um, discussion. Specifically, uh, universities situated in uh, Metro Manila seem to benefit most of this unitary form of government because there the the infra infrastructures are there, so they uh, benefited out out of it. Now, given that my heart bleeds for Mindanao, I want to see um, leading universities established, at least in my lifetime, at par with the rest of the country. And in my view, uh, this federalism will address that uh, problem. Lastly, I am I'm rejecting that idea that local governments are ill-prepared or not prepared in uh, under this new form of um, government. Change is coming. It is my view that many fresh and young blood will participate or take a stab at the local government in the politics of the, uh, at the local states, mainly because it is no longer that, it may be uh, that uh, costly to uh, enter politics in, in the local states. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Fenesius. Um, joining with us also today is Dr. Adrian Tamayo from the University of Mindanao and also a representative from Lihok uh, Federal. Good morning. Um, I joined the Lihok Federal Davao when Sir Cesar and Attorney were still in their 20s. I just joined in, <laughs> in the 1990s no, as a young uh, federalista. Um, well, the thesis that I would wish to share to this forum are the questions. One is identity with the 100 ethno-linguistic groupings in Mindanao, and it is even increasing with the entry of the Kenyu group. Where is really our identity, and where would we locate that? Because ethno-linguistic um, um, identity also relates to ecosystem as well as faith, as mentioned by I, by Sir you know, a while ago about how do you understand Mount Apo now? Is it a source of a resource or is it a church to other um, f faithful individuals? And how would federalism try to provide a context for such practice? So that is the ecosystem. Um, protection as well as the resource mobilization, which would lead me to the second thesis, which is, will federalism accelerate growth or will it dampen growth? Um, fundamentally, um, it would address also the question of, given that five in 10 provinces that are considered poor are found in Mindanao, and of course, we know that there are two cities emerging in our country now, Davao City and the rest of the cities. Uh, and so the proposition of redesigning, you know, reconfigurating, because we might again come to, uh, I think you know your history about, if was it King Louis saying, uh, or the wife of King Louis and the three musketeers? When the people were saying, we are hungry, then the wife told them, give them cake. Uh, because it's a highly centralized uh, format of governments, which would lead me to my next thesis, the governed and the government, the relationship of the governed and the government, leading to the next thesis, which is autonomy and subsidiarity. So those are the things I would wish to share in this forum. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tamayo. We also acknowledge the presence of Attorney Romeo Cabarde, Chair of the University Community Engagement and Advocacy Council. Okay, so let's proceed to our exchange of insights. Perhaps um, Dr. Uh, Professor Go would like to um, respond to some of the statements provided by our panel discussant. Do I have to respond to each and every <laughs> comment? Yeah. Okay. Recommended materials. Uh, I have some e-books. I can share it with you. 
uh, e-books. And of course, uh, you can look at, uh, I think the International IDEA, IDEA, has uh, a compendium, a collection, seven volume series on constitutional change, how to design the executive, the legislature, the judiciary. So each aspect of uh, the government, you can uh, download that, it's for free. Um, so, perhaps for starters, okay. The role of natural sciences. Of course, it's hard for me to tell what should be the role of natural sciences. Uh, I think it should come from them, but they can contribute uh, based from their background, whether mathematics or physics, because if I would say that they should be the role, it's prescribing at the same time. Uh, in a sense, it's stereotyping what I think of mathematics and what I think of physics. Maybe there are other things that I do not know about the discipline, which they can very well contribute to the discourse. So I hope they will be able to find their niche in this uh, debate. Monetary and fiscal policy, that's definitely important. Um, but as mentioned earlier, we'll have one currency. It's very difficult if we will have different <laughs> currencies. But usually in a federal state, that's, I mean, they only have one currency. Yeah. Um, definitions of equality, it's very difficult. Uh, some people think that they're more equal than others. So. So uh, I think uh, that's the point of conversations. We talk to each other and we listen to each other. And if we give everyone a chance to speak and be heard, I think that's a step to equality. <laughs> uh, but uh, to have perhaps a, a strict definition of what that is, maybe it's not that it's impossible, but maybe it's something that we should not be achieving, the definition, but the state of having uh, equality. Uh, it's an interesting question. Do we really need to shift to federalism, both uh, shared by uh, Mam from governance and Sir from politics and history? Uh, I think that's uh, the first order yeah. <laughs> of the, among all the questions that we're asking. Do we really need to shift? What are the problems we are trying to address? And if these are the problems, do we think federalism can solve that? And I would try to connect that with the questions on education. Because if this is the problem on education, we use federalism, will that solve the problem? And as I said earlier, uh, federalism is not the solution for all problems. For all intents and purposes, federalism is about form. It's about structure. And structure is just one thing in the equation. We, look to, we have to look at the agents, the agency part. The people who are within those structure. So regardless of what structure we have, if the agency, the kind of agency that we have re remains the same, then we might be missing the point of shifting or changing. But that's just to simplify the matter. Diversity of faith practices, that's interesting. I have not really thought about that. Uh, but that's something we could try to talk about. Um, in India, it's a federal state. Um, well, there are states which are exclusively Muslim. There are states which are exclusively Hindu. There are states which are mixed. Uh, so uh, I think it's more cultural than political that determines how it is divided. Uh, but I think we can learn from experiences of those countries. Uh, in other countries, it's more of the linguistic background because there are uh, Dutch speakers, French speakers, German speakers in one country. So what they did was to divide the country according to 
I mean, this is a state for German speakers, for Dutch speakers. So maybe the same might apply, but I don't think we have to compartmentalize people by... Yeah, yes, sir. Um, I, I heard from Germany um, with the explosion of the sex scandal in the U.S. succeeding years after some Germans, as a form of protest to, their, to the Catholics, refused to identify themselves as Catholics in their national registry, thereby uh, depriving the, Catholic, the Catholics in Germany of a subsidy from the government, monetary subsidy. Question is, uh, is that even possible or should we entertain that as a possibility when we introduce federalism in this country? Or it, it, that's a remote possibility, if ever that would be considered. I don't know. S subsidizing. Yeah, we're, we're in uh, certain religious tax are being collected, initiated, so that religions, uh, the plural, the various religious groups, could also uh, benefit no, from the collections taken by the government. If that will be part of the system of the government or mechanism. Yeah. And, well, I'm thinking that if ever they will entertain that, that would uh, get a strong lobby against taxation of churches. And uh, politicians might not I mean, assuming they are rational actors, they will not risk it. Yeah. Anyone from the panel would like to add something or raise any questions, perhaps? Well, uh, waiting for responses. Okay. I would like to thank uh, Dr. Serrano for his comments about the social media. Yeah, I think that was something I did not uh, talk about, but that was a good input uh, about students' behavior, perhaps, but also on how we can also tap social media in our quest to raise awareness and inform the public. Right? Because uh, it seems as though social media is more reliable than anything else so far. So... Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Um, can I ask Attorney Parcasio, uh, do you have a timeline in your campaign? Uh, are you thinking that in, in three years time, in four years time, we will be amending our constitution and we are now a federal Philippines? Do you have timeline? Uh, as I uh, said uh, earlier, we are looking into the two-pronged approach of this government or uh, two-track uh, approach uh, as uh, articulated by the uh, Office of the Presidential Assistance for Peace. No? Um, and we're following that, meaning uh, there shall be autonomous regions first before we shift into uh, uh, a federal form of government because tackling the issues on autonomous government is, uh, should I say, simpler since uh, we now have uh, uh, terms of references available, uh, which are the, the peace agreements that uh, the government entered into separately between the MNLF and the MILF. This could be terms of references in the formation of a new autonomous government. Once that is done, then uh, we go full blast into uh, uh, federalizing the country. Uh, that took, that took uh, could uh, could uh, be done simultaneously. It's just that in the order of uh, legislation, uh, the establishment of autonomous region will come first. But at any rate, we hope to uh, be able to have a draft, as we are now uh, uh, doing it, uh, be submitted to uh, the president, uh, the Congress, and the, and the Senate through the speaker and uh, President of the Senate. Uh, bef uh, between now, uh, or within three years, or as early as possible. 
Uh, In sir. other words, uh, before the term ends, uh, there should have been a plebiscite already conducted uh, to ratify a new federal constitution. Are you adopting the entire BBL? Are you adopting the entire BBL? Yes. Uh. Uh, we say that we have to, as I've said, there are, there are references that we have to make, to make, such as, number one, the BBL, uh, which was uh, not uh, approved by Congress, and its basis, which is the Comprehensive Agreement of the Bank Samoro, and the framework of agreement on the Bank Samoro, together with the 1996 Peace Agreement, the Triple Agreement, and the result of the tripartite review that we did since 2008 until the present. Sir. Thank you, and, and I, I hope you will forgive us if we if we go beyond just discussing the issues and instead moving towards advocating it, because we're not, we're not academics. <laughs> but my, my um, just a quick uh, point, a rejoinder on Attorney Bong Prakash's um, um, explanation. We, we feel that we cannot fully implement the comprehensive agreement on the bank tomorrow if we do not amend the constitution and shift towards a federal government. The reason is that the 1987 constitution, which is the legal framework within which we will have to enact a law that will implement the agreement, is essentially unitary. And therefore, it can never fully allow the implementation of a power sharing agreement that breaks up the unitary setup of a government. In a unitary system, there is only single one central source of authority, and that essentially is Congress. So even if it grants authority to lower tiers of government, such as Sangunian, or in the case of the RMM, the Regional Legislative Assembly, that grant is a mere delegation. A delegation, therefore, can be taken back it can be amended, even if you legislate on education in the ARMM, the National Congress can actually amend that or disregard that. And therefore, it, it, it does not serve the purpose of a self-rule for entities such as the Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao. Therefore, you will have really to, to fully implement power sharing, a division of the powers between central government and the, the Bank Samoro government or state government would have to be a shift towards federalism where you have a recognition in the constitution of a two tiers of government acting independently with respect to powers. That the powers that, gra that are granted to the state government cannot be interfered with by the central government. And if it, if, if, if it attempts to interfere, you will have a constitutional court that would say that is beyond the authority of the central government, and therefore you will have to respect the authority granted. If we do not move towards that, then even if we implement the comprehensive agreement on the Bank Samara through the enactment of a basic law, the sword of the Bokles will forever hang at the head of the Bank Samara government. That is, at any time, the legislations that are supposedly under the exclusive list would still be interfered with by the central government. So if you pass an education act in the, in, in the Bank Samoro government in the future that, for instance, integrates Madaris system or shift towards Arabic as the primary um, teaching language in the, in, or in, in the Bank Samoro, the central government through National Congress can simply say, we will not allow that. But of course, we will have to recognize, and I think that is, the, that is the beauty of a shift toward federalism, that even if you emphasize self-rule, there is still an opportunity for shared rule. That is, 
we will have to look at, in, in the case of education, we will have to seriously consider would there be portability of educational qualification obtained in the different states? Would there be mutual recognition of degrees awarded in a state university in one specific state to other states in the country? Because I think we still have to recognize that there would have to be a shared future for all of us, while at the same time we recognize distinct identities for people who who've, who've been there even before the birth of the Philippine Republic in the case of the Bangsamoro. We were independent even before Philippines was conceptualized or even created or granted independence by the Americans. The only way we can recognize that historical injustice would really be to shift towards federalism and then grant them powers that are listed in our constitution and, 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 and uh, mutually agreed by all of us. So I think that's, that's why we, we in, the, in, in, in the Bank Samoro, we are really for uh, a shift uh, to federalism by amending the constitution so that we can also fully implement the peace agreement. Thank you, Attorney Sinarimbo. Uh, yes, Professor Kimba. Um, thank you for your uh, very enlightening comments, sir. Uh, just a point of clarification, because one of the things that somehow people are not so clarified about is pertaining to the role of uh, the army, of the Bangsamoro army in this federal state. How does it interplay with, granting we push with a federal state, how does it, how does it relate with uh, the federal government because that's a concern yung, yung, yung army, yung police yung MI so paano yun siya? Yes, sir I, I, I think there would only be one armed forces uh, in the Philippines because strictly speaking armed forces are supposed to be for external defense it is not supposed to be used against its own citizens and therefore, in the comprehensive agreement on the Banks of Moro, we've agreed in the MILF that we will decommission the forces of the MILF. What we are demanding, we will give up the arms, we will, we will shift from fighting forces into civilians. What we are asking in the comprehensive agreement is that there be a localized or a community policing, which would be a Banks of Moro police, which is which is practically the practice in many federal states, that policing as far as securing your community should really be given to the locals because they know more the conditions of their communities and they would be better in protecting those communities rather than some other people coming in and protecting that community. So there, there would not be a Bangsamoro army. It will be gone. The, the Bangsamoro Islamic Armed Forces will be gone through a decommissioning process. I'm sorry, but I cannot contain myself, especially when we are going to discuss about security. I know my role is to moderate this panel. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, but I was uh, stuck with uh, the argument of Attorney Parkashon, especially when you look at decentralization of power and its implication to national security. Given that in the Philippines, we have three security agenda. We have internal security, we have territorial security, and we have non-traditional security issues, um, uh, calamity response, human tra trafficking, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, with regard to implications for national security, particularly, the question there would be: How are we going to ensure that there would be an equal distribution of assets coming from the Navy, the Coast Guard, granting that our defense system as well as our coast guarding system has limited? capabilities and assets. No? So I, I, I think that's also one of the main questions that we are going to look into, especially if there would be a decentralization of power, uh, granting a federal structure of government, sir. In the 1996 peace agreement, uh, the matter on external security which is the main province of the armed forces of the Philippines, is 
uh, a power of national government. It will be national government who will be primarily be responsible for external defense. And uh, there are uh, you know, provisions in the Constitution that would uh, also um, uh, allow the President to uh, use the Armed Forces of the Philippines for internal security in times of uh, uh, emergency, such as you know, uh, the one that is hotly discussed uh, in recent times. With respect to, uh, to internal security, which is police work, that should be a matter that should be left to, uh, uh, that should be decentralized, uh, such that uh, in, the, in the 1996 peace agreement, there is such a thing as regional security force. Uh, that shall be the, the police, or shall do police work within the autonomous region. In short, external security shall be the main province of the national government, and police work shall be the main uh, a primary responsibility of regional governments. Thank you, Attorney Parcashon. Anyone else? Yes, sir. I just wish to add to the discussion of a uh, uh, lively debate. Uh, looking at the discussion of the internal threats, the assets of the government, well, uh, fundamentally over the last 50 years, we have very, very low asset accumulation. In uh, perhaps that would be, that's the result practically of a unitary form of government. We have a lot of problems and we are indicating it into many other contexts. But perhaps it's because by, by logic, our geographic design is archipelagic, and you cannot just have one uh, bureaucratic agency, one agency to look after the 300 square kilometers, move, one BRP moving around, when in fact it could be done uh, perhaps by regional state. You have one asset from Panacan going to Sulu, then back again when it could be just facilitated according to territorial contiguity. So therefore, by sheer logic, that could be addressed. The needs for asset for naval or coast guard could be immediately addressed by those who need it. We cannot just do blanket request because the whole country needs it. But perhaps it's just needed by one group, island group or by few island group. So there would be now an optimum use allocation of the resources, which cannot be done effectively under a unitary form of government because of the bureaucratic agencies and a lot of leakages along the way by virtue of the agents as, was, uh, as what mentioned. It may be uh, providing a lot of powers to people who are not ready for a kind of system that they are working in. The government is too far from the people they govern. That's the idea why the need to shift to federal government, bring the government down because there are a lot of hungry people. The very, perhaps, uh, um, let me take a little emotions on the discussion. Why there is the need for federal government? It's because there are a lot of hungry people in Mindanao. And there is, a, uh, the incidents of poverty have been happening over the last 30 years. Meaning to say that the parents are providing poverty. The bequest that the parents could do in general is just poverty. That is the next generation's inheritance. Why? Because there is no opportunity, no equal opportunity, in effect, no equity of outcomes. And that's where the political economy that should come in. Governance is there, politics is there, but are this addressing the fundamental need of a household? And what's the fundamental need of a household? One is shelter, Se uh, well, of course the food. Second is shelter. And how these are being addressed? These are being debated by the various sectors, by the various agencies, which again, when addressed, when implemented, are distorted 
again when it was implemented down, resulting of a unitary form of government. Again, going back to the idea that the government is too far. The people in the government or the officials in the government now no, is providing the logic, the idea, the philosophy of mendicacy. The barangay captain needs to go to the mayor. The mayor now needs to go to the governor. The governor now needs to go to the secretary, to the, the ASEC, then the USEC, before the secretary. The many layers of it. When in many other countries, well, we cannot immediately transplant the logic, but it has been proven that um, cutting off, no, cutting off. Well, in, in TQM, total quality management, it's lean organization already. And the unitary government is a thing of the past. It's decentralization, it's autonomy, it's providing people now the room for them to use their skills, for them to use their resources, so that human capital and intellectual capital are created alone when it is found, in the areas where it is found. Look, hunger in the Philippines is not an issue of production. We have a lot of lands where we could plant, no? Uh, you just throw a seed, then it would, no, that's, that's just what they're saying. However, the issue of poverty is not production. It's never supply. It is an issue of purchasing power of the household. It's purchasing power of the household. Um, uh, Balisakan and Dennis Mapa made a little simulation about if there would be a price hike of goods resulting from oil price increase, perhaps there would be 700,000 in households who would experience hunger, and that's extreme hunger, in the next six months. Because they do not have, the, the, the prices in the market are too far, no, too expensive for their pockets. So the, the issue of federalism is, to me, is Plain and simple. That is what we have when Sultan Kudarat was the reigning uh, uh, head. Uh, when Srivijaya was there and the Iranians were there, it was a Sultan and Datu. That's the kind that we have. That's the kind of system that we have. When it was transplanted by, when we were colonized by the Spaniards, it was changed. But then again, the cultures are there, the traditions are there, which does not fit well under a unitary form of government. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Tamayo. Can I say something? Okay, yes, Sir Harvey. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't know if I will trigger something here. You know, um, I do not believe that the Bank Samoro was older than the Republic of the Philippines. In fact, their development was in parallel. Um, what existed in the past were sultanates, you know, different independent polities in the south. That is what we acknowledge. Historically, uh, they existed. And that's the historical inspiration why the Bangsamoro was formed. Um, the ideational um, background to the Bangsamoro is historical. It's religious. There's all, uh, and there is also a ideational background to, to the development of the Republic of the Philippines. I'm not defending the Republic of the Philippines. You know. I'm just trying to show that these two things, these two, two states, you know, um, these two conflicting national identities developed because of colonialism, because of colonization. Um, the Bangsamoro idea was formed um, during, after the colonization, it was distilled. In fact, there was a contribution coming from the Spaniards and the Americans. The Americans were the ones who, who categorized the Moros into Maranao, Iranon, okay? because they, they, they brought in anthropologists and the role of the social scientists to categorize people as if they're animals in a zoo. No? And they, the, the Americans also distinguished the different Indo identities, uh, and th this colonization uh, is is affecting us today. Uh, I I believe that the Philippines is a social construct. It it 
it, it developed over, th over time. But there is an element in this nationhood that, that, that we are, that, that is not integrated, and that is the bang Bangsamoro, a very important element in the fabric of our nation's, nationhood. And, and I believe that federalism, at least at the ideational level, could address this. And education has a role. No? Education, our textbooks, if you read it, it, it's providing a hegemonic discourse on what a Filipino is. Sorry for that. <laughs> I'm trying to provide a counter hegemonic discourse. Um, you know, um, if you look at the Philippine history textbooks, the, the, the history is when the okay, pre colonial Philippines, a little bit of that, and then Magellan came, and then fast forward 300 years. Towards the end of the colonization period, you have Philippine, the birth of the Philippine um, nationalism, okay. um, centered in, in central and southern Luzon. Okay. And this nationalism grew all throughout, you know, um, and then, and then um, became the hegemonic discourse of what the Philippine nation is. And this enfranchised a lot of groups. Not only the Bangsamoro, but the Hiligaynons, the Bulanons, and the Cebuanos, who think that people in, in the center um, decided their fate, and not just simply decided their fate, crafted a vision of history that is centered in Manila. Read the textbook and you will see what is this, where is the number one um, place where, where, you know, uh, where, where the nation was born, it's in Manila, it's in Cavite, you know, the stars in the Philippine flag, they are all in the Tagalog speaking areas in the Philippines. Why not, why not reformulate the meaning of the flag to be more inclusive? Only one star represent, represents Mindanao, one star for Visayas, one star for Luzon, but the whole of the sun, the eight rays is in Luzon. In the Katagalugan Republic, doon lang may araw, wala kaming araw, between lang. Buti na lang may buwan ang mga moro. You know? um, so, uh, I think it's also, you know, um, what we are teaching in, inside the classroom. Basic education. Bayang magiliw, perlas ng silanganan, we tell them that. Okay? Um, and, and we teach them the different ethnic groups. So what? No? Um, are we even encouraging Filipinos to learn Ilocano, to learn Hiligaynon, to learn the other languages in the Philippines, you know, to make this country more inclusive? Um, you know, I think the, Philippines the, the, the Philippine educational system should provide this inclusive discourse. I think yun lang. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, yes, Attorney Senarimbo. Rimbo. Just a quick uh, rejoinder, and I, th and, and, and I thank you for, for articulating that. But more importantly, I think, is the fact that, um, that the sultanates in, in Maguindanao and in Sulu, even before the arrival of the Spaniards, were, in a sense, even before we came up with a Westphalian doctrine of statehood, were already states. because. In, in law, what are the essential elements of statehood? You have a territory, you have a people, you have a government, you exercise sovereignty. All of those were exercised by the sultanates. They were dealing with the United Kingdom, England, essentially, the Chinese. They were entering into treaties, an expression, an indication of sovereignty. They have a people, they have a territory, they have a government. And that is even before a government was born in Manila or imposed by the Spaniards in Manila. So th there is, in a sense, an independent statehood for those people. And when we were forming the Philippine Republic, Aguinaldo wrote a letter inviting the Sultan of Sulu to, to become part of a government that would revolt against the Spaniards. And the response from the Sultan is that, we're not part of your republic, we're independent, and therefore, we do not wish to be part of your republic. When the Malolos Constitution that formed the republic was, was, was enacted in Bulacan, we were not represented there. And yet, we were made part of the Philippine Republic without our consent. 
neither were we asked to a plebiscite if we wish to be part of the new republic being created. That is a historical fact. That is a historical injustice. The only way we can, to a certain degree, address that would really be allow these people to have a state in a federation so that we don't break up the whole Philippine identity and still allow them the honor and the recognition that, yes, you were states even before we were states, but that if you are willing to be part of it, we can get that through a plebiscite. So that is the opportunity for us. We have the opportunity to correct that historical injustice, and I think we should not deny that to, 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 to our people. If we are given that opportunity through a constitutional amendment and we ask everyone, do you want to be part of this republic through this setup? I think that is a perfect way of addressing that historical injustice. Thank you, Attorney Sinarimbo. Um, before we are so driven with our emotions, no? um, um, and since we have, a, I am a very emotional person. <laughs> so we come to the end part of this um, presentation on behalf of the Center for Politics and International Affairs and the USIC or the University Community Engagement and Advocacy Council. We thank you for joining us in this roundtable discussion. So we are going to present the certificates for our panel discussant and to Professor Go. And then after that, we are going to have a photo shoot and then uh, we are all going to proceed to F700. Thank you. For lunch on lunch. Certificate to Attorney Randolph Parcasio. I think that's yeah. To Attorney Nagib Sinarimbo. Sinarimbo si yes. <laughs> to Mr. Cesar Lidesma. <laughs> Dr. Adrian Tamayo. Ms. Edelyn Gopiteo, PhD. To Mr. Rowie Kimba. Maria Richelle Abordo. Sir, Richelle. Mr. Dr. Donald Venetius. Dr. Eminel Jane Alvior. Wrong spelling of certificate. Ano ba yan? Papalitan natin to. Nagwala. Mr. Ramon Beleno. And Dr. Jerome Serrano. Um, I request everyone to have a picture taken. Sermon. Malian spelling. Sir, picture.